I want to thank Bob and Nancy Wirtz for the beautiful flowers, for Robin for an incredibly gifted reading, and our music team for all the wonderful music that they provide us each week. We're on week two of our 13-week series on Living the Science of Mind, a book of essays by Ernest Holmes. Now, each week is independent, so don't worry if you missed last week. Uh, it'd be great, though, if you could go out to our website and take a look. I think that every week is important. This week, our focus is on religion and spirituality. You know, some people use the terms religion and spirituality synonymously, but Ernest Holmes did not. So our focus this week is on how religion is sometimes a part of our spirituality, but not always. So first of all, your question for the week, and admittedly, it's a little bit long this week. What is the one choice that you can make today to be receptive to the greater side of your nature? To feel the presence of God in everything and in everyone and then to embrace a religion of joy, free from fear, and filled with the hope, the aspiration, and the faith of the enlightened masters of all ages. So one more time, what is the one choice that you can make today to be receptive to the greater side of your nature, to feel the presence of God in everything and in everyone, and to embrace a religion of joy, free from fear, and filled with the hope, the aspiration, and the faith of the enlightened masters of all ages. So let me start with what Ernest Holmes wrote about religion. All religions are attempts to interpret man's relationship with his indwelling and overarching infinite with a spirit which fills all nature, all time, and all space with its presence. The purer the religion, the more completely has it approached an attitude of unity, a complete oneness between God and man. Jesus boldly declared, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. The purer the form of the religion, the more perfectly has it presented the idea of an indwelling presence which directly responds to man's thoughts. So we might interpret this as religions try to define for man how man can be in relationship with God. And I think that through time, man has indeed used religion to find a connection with that higher power possibly seeking for a way to connect with something that's more powerful than we often feel ourselves to be. And religion through the ages has also changed a little bit. I think it's important to notice the part of the quote where Holmes said, the purer the form of the religion, the more perfectly has it presented the idea of an indwelling presence which directly responds to man's thoughts. Religion is meant to present that idea of an indwelling presence, which is what we teach. The God without is the God within each of us. And we've discussed in our first week of this series that presence which responds to our thoughts. We probably all know many religions who make this relationship with the higher being one that involves fear or a punishing God or a judgmental God. In fact, Holmes reminds us the morbidity which has come with the sense of isolation and separation from God must be healed if joy and laughter are to take the place of sorrow and tears. How can we believe in a weeping universe or a sad God or a melancholy first cause? Such concepts would contradict the fundamental necessity of reality that God is a synonym 
for wholeness. And it is in part because many of those religions make God separate that Holmes never truly wanted a religion to be part of the philosophy which he spent his life spreading. In fact, in his essays we read, probably no one could have had less desire than I to organize or launch a new religion. I am a great believer in all religions and am firmly convinced that every man's faith is good for him and that the form it takes is best for him at the particular time he follows such form. I think that speaks to why as a community that we are radically inclusive. It really doesn't matter what religion is the religion of your past or your presence or where you are on your path to spirituality. What does indeed matter is that you know that this philosophy we share is one of wholeness one of joy, one of laughter, one of love, one of non-judgment. And I'm particularly grateful that Holmes finally did begin what is known as the religious science religion based on the science of mind teachings. This religion is indeed one that approaches an attitude of unity, a complete oneness between God and man. And it emphasizes that God dwells within each of us. Last week we talked a lot about how our thoughts are powerful. And I was wondering how many of you took that challenge to pause a few times each day and just notice your thoughts and notice where they were leading you. If we believe that the divine works through us, we cannot feel separate from the highest power. And when speaking of religions, Holmes reminds us that the recognition that the spirit thinks through our thought and expresses itself through our act must necessarily create an intimacy which makes divine communion more real and more beneficial than would any concept based on the thought of God as separate from our lives. I know if I'm going to be part of any religion, I want that religion to be one that makes divine communication real and beneficial, and not one that has me believing in a God out there, or a judgmental God that's judging me when I miss the mark, which is what many religions call sin. I also don't want it to be a religion with a God that requires me to earn love by following certain rules. You might remember that in Luke 17, Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom of God is within us. And in his essay on religion, Holmes wrote this, the secret place of the Most High is neither in the holy mountain of Samaria nor at Jerusalem. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom is finished, complete, and perfect for eternity. But the manifestation of this kingdom is the eternal activity of right ideas, law, order, truth, and beauty. So I might take this opportunity here to ask you how you want to manifest this kingdom this kingdom of God that's right within you. What ideas, what order, what truth, what beauty are you bringing into your life so as to recognize that the kingdom of God is right within you? I love that last paragraph of his essay on religion. The communion of the soul with this overpresence is a natural act. To feel that a presence greater than we are is guiding us is normal. To trust this presence is sanity. To desire that the divine eternal shall project itself through our thought is to be receptive to that greater side of our nature which lies open to the upper reaches of thought. This is religion. 
Now that's an idea worth embracing. To desire that the divine eternal projects itself through our thought so that we might be receptive to the greater side of our nature, to that side of the nature that many times we just deny, to that God expressing within us that we don't always listen to. That's definitely a religion that I want to grasp onto and make alive in my life. How about you? And I love that Holmes said, to trust this presence is sanity. Because actually, if we live our life in distrust that God is really our source, that is insanity. That really does make us worry and fearful. Have you ever thought about the insanity that overcomes us when we get stuck in our fear or in our doubt that the divine is right where we are or in our belief that life has to be difficult? Hey, I've been there, wondered sometimes why life has to be so difficult. Why me mentality? In the thinking of what else is going to go wrong? Or why does life really have to be this difficult today? I don't know about any of you, but I have those moments that come into my thoughts. We all end up there at one point or another. The key is to trust the presence of the divine in our life. And as I said last week, to know that when we turn it over to God because we're having difficulty handling it, that we can trust that all is well. I'm not saying it's easy. And I am saying that it does get easier the more we practice. I know in my life that I used to allow myself to stew on things for days. Something would upset me or somebody would do something that I thought was unjust or I would make a mistake and do something and hurt somebody's feeling and I would let it bother me for several days, sometimes weeks. Well, I finally moved into a place where I allowed myself to be upset for a day, and when I woke up the next morning, I forced myself into forgiving myself for whatever it was, or into offering forgiveness to the other person. Now, it's not always easy to do that, but if you go to bed at night and just let go of everything that's gone on during the day and release all of those thoughts into the divine, then you can wake up the next morning knowing that you can forgive yourself or someone else. So I got better and better at it until I finally would just say, well, this is silly. Why am I allowing myself a whole day to be upset? And I decided I'd let myself be upset for just an hour. Well, now it's down to 20 minutes or less. And most of the time, I can shift my thinking in a very short time, as long as I stay focused on who I am, this divine child of this infinite presence. Which brings me to the next part of our discussion, and that's the discussion on spirituality. Holmes likens spirituality to beauty. The artist feels beauty, senses its presence, and to a degree communes with it in drawing it into his own soul that he might outbreathe it through his performance. If I were to take everyone watching this video to an art gallery, let them in and give them a few hours to walk around, to wander around to see all the beautiful art, and then reconvene them all to discuss their favorite pieces, or what touched their heart the most, or what struck them as the most beautiful art in the gallery. I would probably get almost as many answers as people that I asked. It's because we all see beauty from our own perspective. There's no doubt how this phrase came about, that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And I believe that's also true with spirituality. 
We are each individuals who have walked our own path on this planet. We've had our own difficulties, our own joys. So where we are along that path is unique to us. And in his essay on spirituality, Holmes writes, Spirituality is one's recognition of the universe as a living presence of good, truth, beauty, peace, power, and love. And to this should be added happiness, joy, enthusiasm, and universal harmony, which, like the great rhythm of life, flows through everything. Like the great rhythm of life, all of those things that were mentioned, truth, beauty, power, joy, enthusiasm, flows through everything. Now, I admit that sometimes my human emotions get in the way of allowing that joy and that enthusiasm or that God rhythm of life to flow through me. It's in those times that I remember. Holmes tells us not to wonder whether we are spiritual, but rather to accept it as our nature. Not always as easy to do as it is to say. But Holmes also writes That's that spirituality is a constant, consistent attempt to feel the presence of God in everything and in everyone. A constant, consistent attempt to feel the presence of God in everything and in everyone. Notice that it doesn't say some of the time, or in some things, or in some people. It's constant and consistent. And it's an attempt to feel the presence of God in everything and everyone. And I think therein lies the challenge. It's a practice. We have to continually bring our consciousness into alignment with that kingdom of God that lives within us. We need to learn to see God in everything and in everyone. And sometimes that can be very difficult. How do we see God in a person that kills people or that rapes children? Jesus was a great example of just seeing the presence in everything and everyone. You probably know the story of him when there was a woman about to be stoned and he stepped up and said to let the person who was without sin, in other words, the person who had never missed the mark in their life, to be the person to throw a stone. No one did. Because we've always had some things in our life where we probably felt like we missed the mark. In the reading today, you heard from Robin both the basic principles of our philosophy as well as the global heart vision, both of which guide how our centers for spiritual living participate in their communities and in the world. These principles are powerful ones to adopt and remember, they're the basis of this philosophy. In case you want a copy of that reading, go out to our website and there's a link where you can download those principles and that global heart vision. I was raised Catholic and I learned a lot from that philosophy, more than many probably because my parents took the love that's the basis of all religions and demonstrated it in our home. And yes, while I did have some guilt, it wasn't the basis of how my sister and I were raised. I think we were New Thought Catholics. We loved Jesus and we knew that love was the essence of life, not guilt and not judgment. My faith is very deeply rooted in that love, in the belief that what matters in this human form is how we treat each other, how we get along with others, how we demonstrate love. I think my upbringing is exactly what Holmes meant 
when he wrote this. The ethics of Buddha, the morals of Confucius, the Beatitudes of Jesus, together with the spiritual experiences of other great minds, constitute viewpoints of life which must not be overlooked. The mystical concepts of the ancient sage of China keep faith with the saints of Emerson, and wherever deep cries unto deep, deep answers deep. It's about all the great teachers, how they expressed, how they loved, and how they knew love. Holmes truly believed in the foundations of all the great master teachers. It doesn't matter if it was Buddha or Confucius or Jesus speaking, the great truths are just that, truth. And these principles on which our centers are based have a grounding in the one life that's God's life, and that's our life right here and right now. The essay on the principles talks about how these other religions relate it to the principles on which our centers are based. I don't want to overlook, though, that last line. Wherever deep cries unto deep, deep answers deep. When writing Psalm 42, the psalmist coined the phrase, deep calls to deep. And it was meant to describe the place where our deep need meets God's all-sufficient presence. Let me repeat that. Deep calls to deep describes the place where our deep need meets God's all-sufficient presence. Notice that Holmes writes, deep answers deep. When we live in a place of being rooted in our faith, of knowing that God is the indwelling presence, we don't have to wonder if our requests are answered. Deep answers deep. When we have a deep need and make a request, it is answered. We can rely on our spirituality to know that our prayers are answered to know that God's presence is within us and our questions are answered even before they're asked. We talked about last week, we must believe our prayers are answered. Our work on this planet is to live from the presence that dwells within us, to live from a place of unity with others to see God in everything and in everyone. So I want to leave you with these words about prayer from the essays that are part of this week's reading. Prayer in its truest form is not a petition, not a supplication, not a wail of despair. It is rather an alignment, a unifying process which takes place in the mind as it reaches to its divine self and to that power which is greater than human understanding. In the act of such prayerful and reverent communion with God, one senses the unity of good, the completeness of life. And at times the veil of thought is lifted and the face of reality appears. This consciousness which has been referred to as the secret place of the Most High, is an experience rising out of the conviction that God is all there is, beside whom there is none else. Prayer, then, is communion, and this communion pronounces life to be good. I know I want my life to be good, I want to be conscious of that secret place of the Most High. I want to be in reverent communion with God. And I want those veils of doubt to be lifted so that I can see the face of reality, 
that face of the divine, that it's the essence of who each of us are. So in summary, decide this week to truly live from that place of embracing your own spirituality and being spiritually guided. No religion for what it is. It's an attempt to interpret man's relationship with this indwelling presence, with this overarching infinite, and to define for man how to be in relationship with God. Your religion is how you define your relationship with God. So accept your own spirituality. Spirituality is a constant, consistent attempt to feel the presence of God in everything and in everyone. Embrace faith and believe. Live from the presence dwelling within you, from that place of unity from that place where you know the secret place of the Most High. So here's your affirmation for the week. How is it that I so easily and willingly make the choice today to be receptive to the greater side of my nature, to feel the presence of God in everything and in everyone, and to embrace a religion of joy, free from fear, and filled with the hope, the aspiration, and the faith of the enlightened masters of all ages. So your challenge for the week is make a conscious choice every time that you feel annoyed or aggravated or out of sorts in any way to pause and breathe into that indwelling presence to feel your religion of joy, your religion of enthusiasm, rather than the annoyance or the aggravation. Now go live from that presence that dwells in you. Let's pray. We just take a deep nourishing breath and we move into that secret place of the Most High that is right within us, knowing that right where we are, all that the divine is, exists. The joy, the love, the freedom, the peace, the ease. And what I know to be the truth is that this divine being is right where each of us are. That our own spirituality depends upon us recognizing that God is in everything and everyone. And that whoever we are and wherever we are, we have that indwelling presence right within us. So I am grateful. I'm grateful for this message this week. I am grateful for all of the people that help to bring this community together. And I'm grateful to remember that when deep calls unto deep, deep answers deep. And it's from all that gratitude that I release these words into the law of mind, spirit, and action, knowing the truth, that God's already called it done, already said yes, already answered. So I can just let it be. I say amen. And we can affirm it together. And so it is. And now I just want to thank you for listening to the offertory song and for those of you that are sending in your contributions I want to really let you know that they are making a difference for this community so that we can continue to bring you these services.